here we are, smack in the middle of the holy week. The day is crowding behind us, and pressing in before us, and time winding down. As Christian citizens of the year 2022, of course we know what comes next, and it isn't pretty. But as characters within the narrative of this week, we don't know what's next. Like so many other characters in this drama, we are, as is often said, in the dark. And not, the, not in the problematic sense that equates darkness with evil, but in the sense that human knowing operates differently than divine knowing. That the order of God is not the order in which the human body and human consciousness currently dwell. As Dr. Baker reminded us yesterday, Jesus fully participates in the divine economy, even while the earthlings continue to circulate in that earthy economy of coins. Both economies show up today in today's story, albeit a little differently. Tables and chairs aren't overturned, but predictable human patterns are cast out into the night. And all we can do as unknowing creatures of the narrative is watch. We cannot yet go where Jesus is going with all this, but we can sit still and listen. We can be uncomfortable, and we can wait to be rearranged. Like our current chapel arrangement, today's passage is kind of dislocated from the norm. The last meal in this account is not a Passover meal, as it is in the synoptics, but one shared during the period of preparation. It lacks the elements that would qualify it as, as an institution of the Eucharist, the breaking and giving of bread that is Christ's own body to his friends. And it follows the one and only gospel narrative of the washing of the feet, which we will experience tomorrow. These dislocations put us a little on edge. They create an atmosphere of instability. The usual hierarchy has been overturned, and as our story opens, betrayal has already been invoked. The disciples gather around a low table, and the air is heavy with scent. Bread, wine, oils, herbs, and dampened skin. Clean skin, freshly washed, and less clean skin, soured by the dust and duties of the day and by the sweat of anxiety. Flames cast shadows on walls, magnifying every move. Night sounds echo from without. And there are bodies, bodies in close quarters, leaning in, reaching for food, murmuring in the nearest ear, and into this crowd of bodies, Jesus speaks from what we are told is his troubled spirit. Very truly, I tell you, he says, one of you will betray me. The energy in the space is troubled as well. The disciples look at one another, uncertain of whom he is speaking. Intimate friends grow aware of one another, as animals do of threat. Senses are sharpened. Nervous systems are activated. As sociologists such as Rasna Menachem and Brene Brown have taught us recently, betrayal, like other forms of violence, including shame, humiliation, rape, murder, and racism, these happen among bodies in space. And what's more, they are possible only among intimates, betrayal in particular. It is possible only among people who are close. For there to be betrayal, Bernie Brown writes, there first must be trust, or at the very least, the hope of a shared reality. The quarters are close and the atmosphere is thick, intimate bodies are gathered, and betrayal is in there. When the beloved disciple asks who will betray him, Jesus indicates it will be the person to whom he hands a dipped piece of bread. Jesus' foreknowledge here is meant to help build the case for his divinity. 
but it also suggests Jesus' awareness of an underlying structure of the way things work among and between humans. As Jesus dips the bread and hands it to Judas in a shadowy, kind of anti-Eucharistic moment, it is as if he invites a certain sequence to play out. Do quickly what you are going to do. The silent response of Judas, who takes the bread and immediately goes out into the night, it feels automated, kind of devoid of human will. And of course, as we've been told here and elsewhere in this gospel, Judas is in league with none other than Satan himself. Judas's connection with Satan is often read as a warning against individual sin, as a warning to make different personal choices. Judas is the foil of the beloved disciple. He will lift his heel against Jesus, while the beloved reclines against Jesus' chest, that house of God. One will turn away while the other draws close. For the sake of our own souls, we might be told, we should model our behavior on that of the latter. The truth is that we're all on the spectrum here. Most of us, most of the time, between uh, behave less like either Judas or the beloved disciple, and more like the clueless disciples in between, those who, despite all the signs to the contrary, decide Jesus is sending Judas on a run to AGE. <laughs> it's my sense that this passage isn't about individual morality at all, about our choices as Claire or Mandra or Nathan. It's my sense that in the thick of the moment where bodies are pressed close and tensions run high, we are invited to understand humans not as individuals, but as a system, a single nervous system. We are invited to ponder the collective nature of what's happening. Within the collective, Judas does play a particular part, one that lies dormant in every system of intimates. It's the part that may do violence to the system by acting out of self-interest, the part that seeks to use the resources of the collective for the glorification of the self. We might think here of local superpowers, whose aggression serves particular egos. We might think of social powers whose policies protect certain bodies. The part that Judas plays as keeper of the purse is the part that's in invested in the human temple economy, the self-serving one. And that economy, my friends, is not the economy into which we are being invited this week. The economy into which we are being invited is the one of which Jesus, mere seconds after Judas departs, begins to speak. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, he says, and God has been glorified in him. And then, perhaps seeing mystified looks on the faces of his friends, Jesus lowers his register. Little children, he tries again. I am with you only a little longer. Where I am going, you cannot come. I give you another commandment, that you love one another. If we had to summarize today's passage for, say, a writing assignment, it might go something like this. Where intimacy is, betrayal happens. Within the even betrayal is absorbed into war. This is not a thing you can understand now. But here's a version of it to sit with. Love. Love is the only way to undo the violence within the system and to restore its integrity. Mm -hmm. An even further reduction might go like this. Betrayal, yes. And, nevertheless, the surprise of love. We can't immediately follow Jesus into this baffling new arrangement. In subsequent verses and chapters, Jesus acknowledges this, but says that someday we will. He promises to send an advocate who will enkindle in us the capacity to become a new body, a new collective, a new nervous system, to put on the mind of Christ so that even the parts that betray within and without might be taken up into glory.
Since I think that psychologists link our ability to heal with our access to a higher, more expansive consciousness, one that holds our own wounded parts and those of others in compassion, which literally rearranges our neural pathways. But at this point in the narrative, at this point in the week, we can't yet follow Jesus fully into this new body of love. We have to stay dislocated a little longer. These quarters are close, and the atmosphere is thick. The bodies are gathered together. Feet will be washed, and bread will be dipped. And the question for us is this. When we receive that bread, where will we carry it? Into the human, anti-Eucharistic economy of self-service? Or into the divine, Eucharistic economy of collective? love. Mm -hmm. Here in 2022, we might want to sing hallelujah and rush toward the altar with outstretched palms. But as characters in that narrative, we can't go there yet. We can't know what's next, though we can sense it. We can only sit in this close, dislocated space and listen in wonder to Jesus' new commandment, to Jesus' nevertheless that where betrayal lives among intimate bodies, so might live its opposite. That a new collective body is possible, one that looks like and participates in the life of the Trinity, one that can only be described in the language we have now as love. New language, a new arrangement is on the way. Let it be so.